bring in folks from the coffee break. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, welcome. This is uh, the closing session of the fifth annual State of the Net Conference. I want to thank everybody for coming. After this particular presentation, I believe, unless I've tra lost track of my schedule, we'll have a cocktail reception um, uh, in, the, um, in the name of uh, uh, cooperation and, and civility. So um, I welcome, I'm buying, I welcome, welcome everybody uh, to join me afterwards. Uh, this is the final uh, panel. It, it is the final report of the Internet Safety Technical Task Force, Enhancing Child Safety and Online Technologies. It is a presentation uh, to the, um, I want to get this correct, the, um, multi, the Attorneys General Multi-State Working Group on Social Networking in MySpace, um, which came together uh, in February of 2008 um, at the Attorneys General's request. Uh, this task force was formed. Uh, Harvard Berkman Center for Internet and Society um, I took up the task of actually doing the uh, assiduous amount of work, uh, a, a tremendous amount of work assiduously. Um, this is in the, for, any, for those of you um, who maybe knew the issue and looking around there aren't many of you new to the issue, um, uh, this came together, um, a, it was a year long work product and I think in the, in the panoply of internet safety reports um, it ranks certainly up there with the COPA Commission report. Um, and the Dick Thornburg National Academy of Sciences report, Youth Pornography and the Internet, um, which was released in 2002. Um, we have provided printed copies for all of you of, of this report. Um, we, the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, took it upon ourselves to, to do this printing. I know there's limited funds for distribution, so we we're happy to do that, um, as we did with the, the COPA Commission report um, back when it was released. So um, uh, please take that home, uh, uh, save you some copying. What is not there? Um, are the appendices uh, for the report. And apparently there's a link inside um, where you can, you can find the appendices. And it's on our website if you go to the agenda for this conference. It's linked to from the agenda. Um, and you can download the full report and I'm sure on the Berkman's website. Um, what we'll do today is we'll have a presentation from uh, John Palfrey, who's the director of the Berkman Center. We will then go into some, some responses from several members of the task force and we'll, three or four minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And, uh, and, and I mean that by question and answer. And if we could just you know, limit it to questions and, and, and kind of uh, be sparse on the comments, uh, that'd be great. And then we'll continue uh, be walking around with wireless microphones for anybody that wants to ask some questions of this particular panel. Um, so with that, let me introduce John Palfrey from the Berkman Center. Tim Lurden, thank you so much both for uh, the introduction and for the venue, a chance in front of Washington's finest to release this report that we've worked on for uh, nearly a year. And uh, thank you also for taking it upon yourself and the caucus to print up the report in hard copy form. We were relying on um, digital distribution, but uh, this was a very generous thing for you to do and, and thank you. Um, uh, two other important thank yous, um, one to the uh, attorneys general who are the uh, source of this process in a way. The um, way that we get to today is that about a year ago, the uh, attorneys general led by Roy Cooper, the attorney general in North Carolina and Richard Blumenthal, the attorney general in Connecticut, entered into a joint statement with MySpace and then subsequently a similar one with Facebook. And in that joint statement, they uh, agreed to do many different things, one of which was to form a task force. Um, I uh, was uh, lucky enough to be uh, asked to chair it and uh, 29 uh, member groups have joined with me over the course of the year to do it. So to the attorneys general who have exercised great leadership on this issue and uh, I think provided a very important forum and forcing function for doing a lot of work this year, um, I extend my personal gratitude and I know of the task force as well. Uh, and lastly, thank you uh, to all who with uh, the um, uh, spirit of volunteerism and spirit of uh, enhancing the public interest have worked through the task force. There are 29 uh, organizations from companies to uh, child safety experts and others who uh, worked very hard this year on a contentious issue. Uh, we also had outside groups, which I'll talk about, a research advisory board, a technology advisory board. And the most remarkable thing to me in some ways about this report is that um, everybody came to it, I think, in the spirit um, of serving the public interest. And at our very first meeting, uh, we had a round robin of introductions where uh, we said, why are you here? And lots of people had impressive credentials. Donna Rice Hughes, impressive credentials around um, uh, content and Mike McCann at Verizon and so forth. Everybody had an important reason to be there, but almost everybody had some statement about um, why they were doing it around kids. I'm a parent of a six-year-old and a three-year-old and certainly that's why I'm standing here. But I know that we all came to this 
complex issue um, because we care about making the internet and the world safer for kids. So in this opening uh, part of the session, before several of my colleague members of the task force reflect on our findings, I want to just give an overview of what we found. Um, I'll do it by summarizing the findings very briefly. It turns out it's a 278-page report, something like that. So um, apologies to those who probably haven't yet had time to read it, but I'll try to summarize it as quickly as I can. I want to talk a tiny bit about the process we went through, um, the process that included bringing a lot of researchers um, from outside the task force and technologists to bear on the, on the problem and then uh, to uh, finish with some of the recommendations that we uh, uh, put at the end of the report um, and then uh, lead into some colleagues. So ultimately, I think the findings of this, of this report are kind of a good news, bad news story. So from the good news perspective, there are two key findings from my perspective. One is that the issue um, that we were most asked to focus on by the attorneys general was about the extent to which our kids were at risk from sexual predation on the internet. And um, there are very few good things one can say about this terrible issue, but the uh, thing that I think is uh, important to bear in mind is that the uh, research we have looked at, the major studies suggest that over a few decades, overall the risk of predation to kids is actually going down. This is not news that we came up with through new studies here. This is something that the researchers at UNH and others through the Department of Justice grants have shown. Um, but all the studies are consistent about this, which to me is something to celebrate. It's to say that the efforts of law enforcement, the efforts for education, the efforts through technology actually are working a little bit. It's not all great, but there's a trajectory the, where the slope of the curve's in the right direction. Um, the other bit of good news that I would pull out of this is that there's a lot of innovation going on, a lot of innovation, particularly using technology, and it's happening both in companies that are social networks and other internet companies, and it's happened among companies that sell into those companies. So one of the things we did was put out a very big call for uh, technology solutions, and we got a lot back. We got 40-plus um, formal solutions, and uh, they are uh, uh, very promising in many respects. So I think those are the sort of two bit, uh, big bits of good news. The two bits of less good news are there still is a problem. So any of us who are parents know well that the worst nightmare would be that this happened to your kid, right? This, that something um, uh, terrifying, to, such as sexual predation, would happen. It is certainly not a problem that is licked. Um, it is certainly the case that um, social networks and other places online are the public spaces that our kids are coming to. It is also the case that we have seen a rise in uh, bullying, peer-to-peer uh, harm that kids are doing to one another, um, and in the issues of access to content, um, there's not a clear story of improvement. There's a story that says um, there still are kids who are getting uh, access to um, harmful content even when they don't want it. So um, there's a persistent problem and one that we have to come together around. The other sort of complex note is there's no one simple solution. This is an incredibly complex problem, um, and we as a task force very clearly um, found, and I think everybody would agree to this, is there's no single technological fix to this. I think we all went in thinking, wouldn't it be great if we just adopted a certain technology that would keep kids safe um, in all of these contexts? And of course the answer to that is not. Um, it really does take a community-based effort, one that starts with parents and teachers that um, all educators need to be involved in. It's one that law enforcement plays a crucial role in and they need more resources. Um, and it does include technology being adopted both in social networks and in other parts um, uh, other parts of the internet. So that's kind of the, the top level findings, none of which I think is earth shattering, but I think it's been put forward clearly by the community in a way that, um, that I think is convincing and, and is right given the data. Um, okay, so how did we come to these uh, conclusions and then uh, to back out to the recommendations that we make through this report? So uh, first of all, we uh, made this a data driven, a research driven process. Um, this is uh, uh, chaired by an academic institution, and what we wanted to do was to say, let's learn from everything that everybody has done before in peer-reviewed, methodologically sound studies, and then from those data, figure out these, what are the real risks that kids face, and then how can we bring to bear solutions um, to make kids, in fact, safer. So um, the, uh, the first uh, overall process that we went through um, was a major literature review. It's included not in the document you have there, um, it's 80 plus pages and it's done by my colleague Dana Boyd uh, and uh, Andrew Schrock. Um, and this research also involved inviting to the task force um, the leading researchers um, of uh, how kids use the internet. Uh, um, 
from around the country. Amanda Leonard from uh, Pew, I think, may be here today. Um, she and many other colleagues came and presented at different points to the task force. Um, and so we had uh, direct access to those who had done, um, done the major studies. The um, gist of the research really did break down along those three um, uh, categories that I mentioned in terms of the risk of kids that, uh, to meet somebody online who then uh, does something uh, sexual to them offline. Um, we so found a great deal, obviously, also about um, unwanted access to content, and we found um, this really growing story about, uh, about online bullying. Um, in the course of the, uh, the uh, research, we learned also that there are major gaps in what we know, and I think this is an important, um, an important note at this stage in the process, to say there are at least two areas where we would urge greater research, greater uh, follow-up, and one I think where the attorneys general and others can help with us in the uh, join with us in the research community to, to improve the research. One big area where I think we need to know more, and we've uh, included this in our executive summary and elsewhere, is we don't know that much about what registered sex offenders do in uh, internet settings, including social networks. This is an area where some task force members, Blair, uh, I suspect from Aristotle will raise this, um, urged us to uh, look into it. There's no good data about this, but it's something there I think we're working with the American Correctional Association and otherwise we could get better information about this and to learn more about what uh, uh, sexual um, uh, offenders are doing in these environments and, and go from there in terms of figuring out more about what we can do to protect kids. The other area we don't know as much as we should know um, is about the peer-to-peer -peer harms, what kids are doing to one another to harm them in these environments. So that involves some of the bullying issues, but it also involves um, some sexual issues um, and it involves uh, content as it, as it turns out. There's a great deal of user-generated content on the web, both sexual in nature and otherwise, um, which peers are making and which harm one another. And that's an area where I think much more research is needed. So the first phase really was, let's summarize what we know, and those are the trends uh, that I mentioned, and learn very carefully what the research suggests, looking across the board, um, and then to go from there to look at the possible solutions, given those problems as, they, um, as they've been described in the research. So the second stage really was, um, to put out a call for technologies. So uh, we did this in two ways. One way was to say to anybody, um, some members of task force, some who happen not to be on the task force, um, anybody, present to us a technology based on a National Science Foundation um, type template. Um, give us uh, a description of what you do and what you think that will um, uh, do to protect kids. And uh, we convened another board, a technology advisory board, which outside computer scientists from uh, mostly academic institutions, but also people who work with law enforcement and others. Um, and they reviewed independently for the task force as a technology advisory board these 40 plus submissions. Um, some members of the task force uh, presented um, uh, to this technology advisory board. It was also people from elsewhere. Um, we were extremely pleased by the submissions that we got um, and uh, find great promise in, uh, in those submissions. We also asked the eight um, technology companies that themselves host kids on their site to tell us what they are doing and how they are applying technologies um, themselves. So for instance, MySpace, one of the um, uh, founding members through their joint statement, works with a group called Sentinel Safe to identify registered sex offenders and take them off their site. Um, another example, um, Facebook develops a lot of its own homegrown technologies. Many of the internet service providers um, provide parental controls and so forth. Um, uh, Second Life, um, the Linden Labs uh, 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 virtual world uses age verification to uh, segment aspects of its site and so forth. So um, in addition to figuring out what's available uh, for people to buy, we looked at what the um, uh, social networks and others were actually putting into place. So that was really the process. It was um, to convene uh, 29 uh, organizations that care a great deal about this topic, to bring researchers in to determine what they have found uh, to be the real issues facing kids um, and, the, and the trends, and then also to call for technologies and then analyze, um, analyze those technologies. So against that backdrop, what we find, um, and I'd uh, refer you to pages 36 and on in the uh, report that you have in front of you, are a series of recommendations uh, in terms of moving forward. Um, the very clear statement that the task force made, and I don't think there are any dissents from this, although we may hear may hear from some, is that um, there shouldn't be a single technology mandated for the purpose of internet safety. Why is this so? I think one reason is there's no one technology that's gonna solve all these problems. Nobody claimed that and just doesn't happen to be true. It would be lovely 
were it the case. Um, we do think that it's useful to use a series of technologies and to do so um, in different settings and technology needs to be part of a suite of solutions. So this again is not breaking new ground against what the COBA Commission and um, Thornburg and others have found, but that a combination of things where technology is part of the solution along with education, law enforcement and collaboration and so forth um, are crucial. Um, so we start by saying no mandate, but yes, technology um, is relevant. I think the top recommendation and the one I would most eagerly see taken up as the chair of the task force, though the task force is now done, we delivered our report by the end of the year, um, is to see um, the pressure that was created by this process for the community to work together to continue. I think the top recommendation that I could make is we need another vehicle to ensure that members of the technology companies are coming together with members of the um, child safety environment and with the um, involvement of the law enforcement and um, other government agencies to ensure that on an ongoing basis we know what the best practices are. I think one of the most useful things about this process is in the report we show what eight leading um, companies are doing using technology and otherwise and uh, I got a sense that there's a growing competition, a positive kind of competition um, among companies to protect kids by using technologies um, and related approaches. I think we need some continued effort of this sort to, to focus on best practices, to um, continue to put technologies as they emerge uh, in front of companies um, and to agree upon what does it mean to be doing the right thing for kids uh, on an ongoing basis. I think this needs to be dynamic because we know um, that the way that kids use the technology is changing, we know that the nature of the harms are changing and we know that technology um, is, uh, is changing over time. Um, but we do also know that some pressure uh, clearly helps and over the course of this year I think the attorneys general can look on this process with pride and say um, the internet is a safer place for kids by virtue of what um, members of the task force did during the course of this year as they saw technologies come by and so forth. Um, I think that uh, there are uh, lots of other recommendations that we make um, in detail. I won't go through every single one but I do want to point out um, uh, a few very specific ones that relate not just uh, to the technology companies themselves. Um, I think one crucial thing that we noted is that greater resources need to be allocated to entities like schools, libraries, uh, and law enforcement themselves to participate in uh, educating kids and giving them the tools um, that they need. There was at least one dissent from this recommendation. We can, uh, you can read about that, but, um, but I think that's uh, something that many, many others agreed upon. We didn't see all that much in the task force about the kinds of tools that law enforcement themselves use, so forensic tools. Obviously, these are something that are very important to keeping kids safe, um, but I think that's an area of focus um, going forward where uh, it's important to look at it. One uh, additional recommendation uh, was around social services, that um, we have gotten much better about putting police into cyberspace, these converged online environments, but we don't have very many social workers there. And one of the things that popped out of the research was that at-risk kids in the offline world are very at-risk in the online world. Not all that surprising, um, but it's also the case that sometimes social workers could do a lot of good by being in those environments, um, providing a supportive environment, um, and that ultimately um, we can complement the use of technology by some of the things that have worked, uh, worked in the offline world as well. And fundamentally, I think we come back at the very end of the report to say um, we need to be uh, focusing on parents and other caregivers who are the front lines of keeping kids safe online. Throughout this process, the uh, task force has come back time and again to say, yes, we need to focus on technologies, yes, we need to provide uh, incentive to use them and to innovate with them, but at the end of the day, a lot can be done by parents and other caregivers, and if we rely on a single technology or if we over, overly rely on technologies in general, we don't want to abdicate that responsibility um, by virtue of a, a focus on technology. So um, uh, all of us as parents are far from off the hook. It's crucial that this be um, a community-based uh, community solution. So um, we're hugely grateful to have had this chance, um, this chance to put these recommendations forward. Um, I want to note a few uh, particular um, responses to the uh, task force report and then um, and then conclude and turn it over uh, to my colleagues here. So um, what might you say by way of dissent from this? I think one of the important things that we uh, did in the course of the task force was note that this is a really complex issue with lots of different people coming at it from lots of different angles. Um, you can't possibly have such an important topic um, without having, and 29 uh, dedicated people without having some dissent. 
Um, I think if you look at the back of the report, we encouraged every member of the task force to write a one-page statement about um, how they uh, viewed the findings of the report to say what do they want to amplify and what do they want to um, uh, note that they disagree with. Um, and I encourage others to, to read that. I think you may have been uh, submitted one. So some of the, um, the, the critiques, at least from, uh, from two members of the task force, include um, concerns about the research. So one of the concerns is that much of the research is a few years old. This is quite right. We have uh, looked over the course of um, uh, the last eight years or so of research and included the peer-reviewed research that we could, um, uh, that we could validate. Um, I think that the, what one will find is the reports that are coming out this spring um, that are going to be more up-to-date continue to show this trajectory, but this is clearly something that um, uh, is a reasonable, uh, reasonable focus. I think we've done a, a very good job of presenting the best research, but um, I think it's sensible uh, to note that there's more and there will be more coming out. Another critique um, that is a reasonable one of the task force work is to say um, some of the attorneys general perceive that in their day-to-day -day work they see more of the kinds of sexual predation than the research suggests. So there's some sense that the research undersells the risk that kids face of sexual predation based on what law enforcement uh, officials are finding in their day-to-day -day work. This is, I th again, I think a place where reasonable people can disagree. Um, I think we've looked very carefully and openly at all of the aggregate data, um, and it may just be that one agrees to disagree, but I think that's an area where um, there's a reasonable, uh, a reasonable uh, argument to be had. Um, I think also the question about um, how much we have uh, focused on any single technology as opposed to arguing in favor of a suite of technologies is another critique that you'll hear. Um, I think, again, the task force has done a very good job of assessing the range of technologies and putting them uh, forward in a constructive way, in a way that we can analyze them. I think there are policy choices to be made here as to whether or not um, some technologies ought to be used, and I think we um, will continue to have those uh, discussions over time. So. Um, uh, in some, this is not a perfect uh, job by the task force, but I think that we've done a very honest and serious one. I think we've been uh, very lucky to have the attorneys general uh, as both um, uh, a guide in this process and as, uh, as supportive collaborators. And I know that I speak on behalf of all in the task force that we hope that this report will be a big step forward and it will present uh, pathways for all of us to follow. Uh, and I look forward very much to seeing the recommendations of the task force uh, carried out in the years to come in the interest of protecting kids both online and off. So, Tim, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, so for the next part of the session, what we'd like to do is uh, we put together uh, four members of the task force. Uh, there, as John said, there are 29, um, I think, 29 members, and we could have picked any one of them. And uh, we picked uh, uh, four people to just give a, a sampling of different perspectives um, from the task force. There's a lot of great other folks that could be up here, too. Uh, looking out at the audience, I see uh, you know half a dozen of them. Mr. Minoff is enough. Um, Stephen Balcom from Family Online Safety Institute. Um, Larry Magid, uh, Smithsonian, Smithsonian Award winner for Internet Safety. Um, Brent Olson from AT&T, um, Mike McKeon from Verizon, I'm sure I'm missing other folks out there too. Um, but we wanted to give a sampling. I think there's some critiques. Um, there are support for the report as well. Um, and we just wanted to give folks about maybe four minutes to just give their responses. Everybody from the task force did provide one-page responses as um, Mr. Palfrey had mentioned. Um, and we. Again, um, uh, this is not any particular ratio of support or critique of the, of the report. I just picked a few different folks from uh, a variety of different perspectives. And, uh, and I will ask you folks to just inter introduce yourself um, in, in your perspective, whether it be from a company or from a, of an organization. We want to start off with Blair Richardson from Aristotle. Then we'll go to Ann Collier um, from connectsafely.org and also uh, the, um, the Net Family Newsletter. Uh, Bartlett Cleland for Institute for Policy Innovation, and then finally, uh, John Morris from the Center for Democracy and Technology. Blair? Thank you very much, Tim. Can you hear me? Just keep speaking. Okay, keep, uh, I'll give you the you one, two, three countdown. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Blair Richardson. I am the general counsel for Aristotle. Uh, we provide identity authentication and age verification services. Uh, like a lot of people here, I'm a last minute fill-in, uh, and uh, you're probably used to the more dynamic voice of Aristotle from John Phillips, so be prepared for something a little less dynamic uh, than John. Um, I want to just thank you for the opportunity, and I want to acknowledge my 
my panelists. This is a very straight shooting group that I'm sitting next to. Uh, I've had a lot of spirited arguments uh, with them over the course of the, of the year, uh, but the debate has always been civilized. And, and probably the main remark I would make about this particular bunch is that they're not afraid of the debate, and they're not afraid to have questions asked about their positions. Um, now, um, I wanted to talk about one important point of agreement with a task force report and two points of disagreement. Um, what troubles me a little bit about the coverage that uh, sort of burst out uh, a day early yesterday is the sense that there's kind of a, a rush to close the inquiry into the issue of uh, predation on social network sites. Social network sites are, are, are different simply because adults and minors are encouraged to interact. Large amounts of information are already up there. I think it's just a fundamentally different kind of, uh, of an environment. Um, I assume that most people who read the press coverage of the task force report probably think that the task force really studied the issue of uh, uh, predation on social network sites. And as John Palfrey just told you, that is not true. We did not do that. There's very little research on that. So I think the main point, I'd like to echo what John just said, and the, probably the main point that I would like people to take away from this today uh, is, is something that the task force all agreed on, and that's that the research on the activities of registered sex offenders and other predators on social network sites, study on, and research on that is really desperately needed. Um, now, that's a point where I think we all agree. Um, we know that there have been at least 50,000 registered sex offenders who've been identified on MySpace. My main, my, probably my main disappointment with the final report is that the task force did not call on MySpace to stop destroying that data and instead make it available for study. I, this is just a point, obviously, we've, we've, we've disagreed on this, but it's such a rare and irreplaceable treasure trove of data uh, about how registered sex offenders uh, are using social network sites, whether they're, uh, uh, how many underage friends they have, what kind of searches they do, it's simply irreplaceable. And to allow it to be destroyed, I think is really unconscionable, and I really, uh, you know, everybody knows my feeling on this, I've been very straightforward about it. I'm very disappointed that the task force did not specifically say, stop destroying the data, make it available for study. Nothing would make me happier than to have MySpace come up at the end of today and say, we agree with the task force about the need to have this data studied. We're going to make it available, and we're going to stop destroying it. Um, the second point of disagreement I have is that um, I, I wish that the final report had addressed the issue uh, basically analogous to the uh, issue of community notification about, um, excuse me, registered sex offenders who move into your neighborhood. In the offline world, you have, uh, you have community notification. In the online world, uh, I would have liked to have seen the task force report address the issue of whether or not social network sites should make an effort to contact minors and or their parents if possible as soon as the social network site knows that the minor's been contacted by a registered sex offender. I don't, f I personally don't feel that this is that controversial. It's something that I raised very early in the task force and didn't get a lot of traction on, and I know other people are gonna have views on it. And my, my, my biggest problem with it is that it wasn't addressed. Not that, not that they didn't agree with me, but that it doesn't even find its way into the task force as an issue to be, to be discussed for the future, and I think that that's very important. So. Um, I'm probably uh, running out of time. We've only got a couple of minutes. I really did appreciate the opportunity to work with everybody. It's been a, a very uh, civilized uh, and, and spirited group, regardless of whether we agreed or not. And I, I thank everybody for that opportunity. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, and thanks especially to John. Okay. Ann? Yeah, I want to thank my colleagues and you, Tim, for this opportunity. And it, it really was an honor, honor for Connect Safely to be on the task force. Um, on the report, though it's not conclusive, I think you know there are three major accomplishments in it. it it's a national level discussion on safety on the, in, on the social web that was very much needed. Other countries are ahead of us in that way, bringing all the key stakeholders together. 
It makes the full body of online safety research accessible in one place so that we can be more fact-based and less fear-based in online safety education. And it acknowledges the international nature of the, of the internet, it's, which is key to any policy discussion. Um, you have to acknowledge that kids can go to sites overseas if they're carted at the door of US-based sites. You have to acknowledge that overseas people can, um, it is very difficult based on US public records to verify the ages and identities of people overseas in, in US sites. Um, so those are um, topics that needed to be brought up and acknowledged at the national level. Um, we just wholeheartedly support the findings of, of the report. We, we feel that it provides both perspective and context to parents and to the American public. Um, perspective in, in terms of um, it expands the discussion and it puts predation, which is certainly a risk, um, into context for parents. We, we talk to parents on a daily basis in many ways at speaking engagements, in email, in our online forum. And if a parent asks you, is my kid at risk? How do you answer that? First of all, you have to ask them a lot about their family conditions. One, one of the most important findings in the report we felt was that not all kids are equally at risk of predation or any other part of the risk spectrum in online safety. And a child's psychosocial makeup and, and family and school environment are bigger predictors of their risk than um, the technologies they use. And this is tracked through the research all the way through all the technologies or internet related technologies that kids have been using. So that body of research is very, very important. It's not out of date. Yes, it is, it, it is ex we're experiencing the limitations of peer review, but it's important to acknowledge that risk is not relegated strictly to a single technology or place online. And that th this um, risk spectrum has been tracked through the years through all the technologies, interactive technologies that kids use. And certainly we need to bring social networking more and more into the discussion, but we also need to have that data released from law enforcement to the research community. More data needs to be available. The FBI doesn't even um, have a database on internet related crime. The FBI told me, uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, that may have changed, but we need to know, um, you know what portion of child exploitation happens um, involving the internet. Um, and, and it is important to acknowledge that the, the risk that most kids face, the most common risk, is cyberbullying and online harassment. Um, the data shows um, that a, a child who behaves aggressively is more than, twice at more, more than twice likely to be victimized, whether that aggressive behavior is talking about sex with strangers in chat rooms, which is where a whole lot of the, the, the problem lies, um, or if a kid is just behaving badly towards his peers, he is more at risk of more than twice at risk, more than twice as likely to be victimized. So I think as we, as we realize more and more that the internet mirrors real life, we're going to find that um, we, we need to acknowledge where the risk is clearly and, and, and understand the full spe spectrum, and that's what really serves the American public. So we're, we're just delighted with what the, the uh, report has revealed. Well, th thank you, Ann. Uh, Bartlett? Thank you. And Bartlett, can you just uh, mention where you, your organization and uh, where you're from? I'd ask John to do the same thing. Tim, thank you. Internet Caucus, thank you. And yeah, we need to start over. I know your microphone didn't work. All right. That, I didn't say a whole lot of importance. Go, thank you, Tim. <laughs> it's extremely it's not important. important. Thank, thank you, Internet. Thank you, Internet Caucus. And um, it, it at least as important, thank you, John uh, Palfrey, for being a, a leader and exhibiting grace under fire, which uh, I'm sure we all appreciated, um, either coming from us or <laughs> external forces. Um, you can read our statement at the back of the, uh, of the release. Um, we're fully supportive, is kind of a simple way of putting it. I came at this process slightly differently than a lot of my colleagues on this task force, uh, simply because of my experience. Uh, 
had a long history of involvement in intermediary liability starting on Capitol Hill and going into think tank world, uh, trade association world. And because of that, um, I don't think I had a unique approach, but it was slightly different than people who were well informed of the dangers of children. I'm going to say my first impression was shock and awe um, at what is really going on out there. Um, and Anne is quite right, it, it had very little to do with the technology. It had everything to do with what's going on in society, and that was uh, disconcerting, especially when you go through these various studies and they talk about various harms. And I guess my point about um, from all of this is that regardless of the harm, whether it's at the one extreme of someone being murdered, killed, committing suicide, or at the other extreme, perhaps extreme, of minor amounts of bullying, it kind of doesn't matter to me. It's my kid online being harmed. Um, and that's kind of the way I approached it. So um, I think the, the debate a little bit about the research and whether there is harm, I think we can all but stipulate for the record there is harm, there are various kinds of harm, um, and we need to be concerned. Yet it's not specific nor unique to technology. It is, however, unfortunately specific to our society. Um, my next point, I want to reiterate something that uh, John said in his tee up, and I think can't be said enough, is that the solution, to the extent that there is a solution to decrease the incidences of bad things happening, and I intentionally don't say an, af an absolute solution, there will never be a solution, there will always be problems, is a multi-layered approach. And I want to call out, as we did in our, in our statement, that while technology may or may not play a small, big, medium-sized role in all this, it may, not, may or may not include the many tools that ISPs and providers and these various platforms are already providing. Certainly what it does t require is, uh, I guess depending on what flavor you might be, if you're um, perhaps on the more liberal side of the spectrum, it takes a village. If you're uh, conservative friends in the room, it's God, family, and country. Uh, but whoever you think it is, it takes all of us helping in our own unique ways to protect our children. And, and I think, it, I, I don't know that we can say that enough. Law enforcement needs the help, parents need the help and guidance, teachers need the help and guidance, and however they get that support from our efforts uh, in the communities personally or as organizationally, I think, cannot be understated, and I really want to call it that portion um, of what we recommend. And so far as I understand, I don't know that anyone dissented from that, nor did anyone dissent from the notion that there is no one magic bullet to solving this problem. There is no tech mandate that will solve this problem. It's much more complicated than that. Finally, um, and they kind of pick up on a thread that Anne brought up, and I think, and, and that Blair mentioned, social networking sites are, are actually, in many ways, not that interesting in this problem, right? They are a step along the path of where there are always problems. Uh, COPA addressed a world before social networking sites. I don't know what's going to come next, but I'll guarantee you in 10 more years, there'll be another group talking about whatever the hot technology issue is where kids are being harmed with that tool. It has very little to do with social networking sites per se. They happen to be the hot platform of the day. The second thing I'd note about that is that defining a social networking site, in fact, I think I would challenge most of you to come up with an adequate and accurate definition. Um, whether it's online gaming, whether it's um, what we recognize as social networking sites, MySpace, Facebook, et cetera, um, or some other kind of platform, whether it's a chat room that you might do via your cell phone, what is social networking? The fact of the matter is they are all places where children can be found. They all provide opportunities for adults and children to commingle. They all provide, unfortunately, an opportunity for bad people to do bad things to kids who are at risk, just like our shopping malls, just like our schools, just like our organizations around the country. It is a societal problem, and I urge everyone to think of it that way and to help us continue this quest in all of our own ways of solving the problem. Thank you, Robert. John? <laughs> You'll get called out on it. <laughs> right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Thanks, there you go. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> um, so thanks. Let, let me try to be brief. But before I kind of get to my key points, let, let, let me just take a second and, and say that I, I, I think that John Costa was being a bit modest in, in his overview of, of the task force and the work that he and his team have done. Um, you know, I, I think John accomplished three pretty impressive things. He he collected um, the most impressive group of academic researchers studying online child safety. I mean, he got together in the research advisory board um, every single unit um, 
Lisa to looking at, at, at online safety. I just mentioned Amanda Lampart, but David Finkelhor and Anna Wolle from the Wolex from the University of New Hampshire Climate Change Consulting Center. I mean, uh, Natalia Clara, Dan Boyd herself. Um, so, so, so this group of researchers who collectively who really top notch, and then the technology. Can you, can you start over? <laughs> Tim, thank you. Um, ho hopefully you heard me extolling the virtues of, of the, 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 the research group that, um, that John Palfrey pull, pulled together. The, the technical advisors that Palfrey pulled together are some of the leading technologists um, with experience about internet security issues. Um, and then the third major accomplishment he did was was simply managing a, a very contentious at times group of task force members. Um, so I mean, I, I think I can speak for all of the task force members that that um, Palfrey and John and, and the Berkman Center um, ran an, an amazing task force. Um, so, but to, to very quickly talk, touch on just really three topics, reactions to the task force report itself. I mean, I, I do think it is the most comprehensive overview of the scientific research that we have and of the most current research we have, recognizing that it takes a year or two for research to get through the peer review process. And, and the real key finding that I think we should take away from the report is not that there are no risks online, there certainly are risks online, but that, that in fact the leading social network sites are, are in fact generally safe environments. That most kids go online and they have good experiences online and, and to the extent that a peer or perhaps even a predator makes an advance to them and says, oh, let's you know, go do something, most kids ignore it. That in fact, the kids who get in trouble online are, are kids who usually are already in trouble in offline environments um, and, and that, that really, um, you know, the, the online world is not significantly different and it's certainly not more dangerous than the offline world, that really kids who are in trouble offline are ones who get in trouble online as a general matter. So I think that's one key takeaway that I take away from the task force report. The, the, the second key, key takeaway that I have is that, is that technology solutions, while they have value and, and, and can be very important in some contexts, um, you know, aren't a silver bullet. And, and don't really go at um, the, the risks online that we did see of cyberbullying, things like that. Age verification technology can be very valuable if you're selling alcohol online or if you're creating an adults-only environment online. Very important technologies for those kind of applications. But for a social network where um, older minors and adults are expected to interact, you know, figuring out how old they are is not actually going to prevent them from interacting because they're on a site where it's expected to, to interact. And, and another conclusion of the, of the research group was that deception is not really a factor in internet crimes against minors. It's, it, it's not that, you know, you have a 40-year-old who, who goes and tells a minor, oh, I'm 15, let's get together. In fact, in the sad cases where minors do end up meeting with adults um, offline and engage in sex, the minors are very aware that the people they're meeting are adults and they're aware that the people they're meeting want to have sex. And so you have a situation of where the, the, the minors involved are, are seriously troubled and, and we need to figure out, I think as John Palfrey said, to figure out how to get social workers to, to be able to spot those at-risk kids. And then the final thing is, just to echo what John started with, is, is that there really, you know, I think there's broad consensus that, there, that a mandated solution, mandated imposed on um, social networks is not the way to go, both because no solution really fully works, there are problems and privacy issues with a lot of the solutions, um, but also, I mean, frankly, because some of the solutions, many of the solutions would be unconstitutional if imposed um, by a government. And, and finally, you know, I think that there's a huge risk of unintended consequences. If we go and shut down the leading social, social 
um, network sites that are based in this country, I think there's a risk that kids will go to sites that are overseas and will be a lot less protective. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there are a lot of takeaways you can have from the report. I, I really do encourage, as Blair said, to um, to, to read to read the t this individual statements. I think they help illuminate um, a, a lot of conclusions and, and show a lot of the discussions that we have. Uh, I want to thank the respondents. Um, one, one, we have a few minutes. If you'll indulge me, um, we might go a little bit over the 4:30 time, depending on how much, how many questions we have. And I'd, I'd ask folks um, to ask questions of the panelists, direct them to an individual panelist, uh, to Mr. Palfrey, or to anyone, in, anyone in general, um, and identify yourself before you ask the question. And Diana will be um, uh, manning the microphone. And uh, so, please, questions and limit the comments. Larry Magan. Hi, my, I'm Larry Maggot, and along with Anne, I represented Connect Safely on the task force. Um, Blair Richardson, you were indeed very collegial during the task force. It was a pleasure to work with you. However, when I turned on the internet today, or one turn on the turn on the light, and went to children, childonlineprotectionservice.com, I found that Aristotle is not only attacking the task force, but making some pretty strong claims about MySpace. And what particularly concerns me about this is your emphasis on the 50,000 registered sex offenders, which, correct me if I'm wrong, have been kicked off MySpace. And it seems to me you're beating up MySpace and beating up the task force, not for dangers that lurk ahead of us, but for problems that we've actually largely solved. And I frankly don't understand the attacks. I understand your financial interest in wanting to see age verification, because it would bring billions of dollars to your company. But I don't understand the attacks. And the, the question? Is just a response to the. Well, I ask the question. I mean, I, I'm asking to justify why you keep bringing up this registered sex offenders, why you're being so aggressive on this, when in fact a lot of this has already been dealt with. If I had wanted to plant somebody in the audience to ask a question, <laughs> it would have been that question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the reason is that the only registered sex offenders that have been identified and kicked off are registered sex offenders who registered under their own name. We have no idea whether these guys immediately went back on to MySpace and used a fake name and went back on. The fact that they were kicked off after being dumb enough, as one of the attorneys general said, we're catching the ones dumb enough to use their own names. So if you can show me anything Larry, that indicates that once a sex offender has been kicked off by MySpace, he goes trundling off and says, well, that's it. I doubt it. I have a feeling that they're back on there, and I don't think there's anybody that could say a technology. I think a technology that removes sex offenders who use their, wrong, uh, their own names m might actually be creating a false sense of security because I believe you just fell into a trap thinking that once they're removed, they're gone for good. I have absolutely no reason to believe that that's the case. Does anybody think that they give up that easily? Uh, John Morris? You, yeah, use the hand mill. The problem with the 50,000 figure is that... John, just, just give me a second, okay? Oh, try that again. All right, yeah, there. The, 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 the 50, 50, I, I fully acknowledge that there may well be sex offenders on social networks, but we have not seen evidence that, uh, that out of the hundreds of millions of users on social networks, that that, in fact, has led to serious child predation. It, the, the evidence suggests that, that most child predation is not happening on social networking sites, but more in chat rooms, which are even less you know, regulated. And, and so, I mean, you know, I think that the 50,000 figure is an inflammatory figure that hasn't yet been shown to translate to an actual risk to kids. So I think, I agree with Blair, we need more research in this area, um, but, but I don't think that that figure alone should, should be a headline to say, oh my God, social networks are unsafe places. Uh, Bartlett? I'll just speak loudly. Um, I'm actually distressed about uh, two points, and I'll perhaps take the more constructive one first. Um, I had an uncle who used to work in the Pentagon in procurement, and he used to drive him nuts when headlines would come out that says, Pentagon purchases $50 million hammer. Because in fact, most all the time, that never happened. 
What actually happened is his office, as part of procurement review and legal office, would catch the $50 million hammer and they wouldn't purchase it. And then, of course, they're required to disclose this information and the press misunder uh, misreported, misunderstood what was going on. Doesn't mean that the bad guys aren't going to try again with a $30,000 screw, but they did get rid of the $50 million hammer. So I agree with um, the point that we need diligence. I think there also should be some acknowledgement that at the very least, the 50,000 registered tobacco vendors were kicked off. And I think it actually goes as a point of understanding that people out there, not least of which are social networking working sites, not least of which are internet service providers, have tools and activities ongoing, tools available for parents, activities ongoing to protect kids online. It doesn't make it perfect and it goes exactly to my point. There is no silver bullet. They have responsibility, they're doing some. We all have responsibility to be productive and that brings me to my second point that is perhaps more A website, that kind of a, an attack, um, is not in the spirit of the report, is not in the spirit of uh, us working together, and not in the spirit of the call from the Berkman Center, and certainly echoed by IPI, and I think uh, the rest of us on the panel. I wish those energies would have been put into uh, helping to catch the bad guys to uh, figure out who those bad guys are, rather than taking full side attacks on um, people who are actually trying to do the right thing. That's why I'm up here asking to see the data and to have it stop being destroyed. I, I could turn to you right now and say, do you think MySpace should keep destroying that data or should they make it available for research? No. But MySpace has been subpoenaed by the AGs for data and it, it's been turned over. Is I'm, that that's data? Just that's just names, that's just names. I'm talking about the records of how registered sex offenders are actually using MySpace. And to the extent that it hasn't been subpoenaed, and MySpace is destroying okay. it, it seems to me we're losing a lot of information that would help us actually answer the question that John, Bart, you and I are talking about is, are they being kicked off, or are you showing them out the front door and leaving the back door and the side okay. door and all the windows open? Let me get to a few more questions, but I, I, just, I can't help but mention um, uh, the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee is a multidisciplined organization. <laughs> I, interestingly, on this issue, uh, the 1130 breakout panel was um, on making online personal information more anonymous. Will it save privacy? So there was a whole discussion about anonymizing mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. um, so That's fine. The, That's it, fine. It, it, it's Anonymize an interesting it. juxtaposition of, of perspectives. Um, yeah. Britain. And just identify yourself. And Hi, I'm, I'm Braden Cox, and I'm with NetChoice. And I, first of all, I want to thank the, the John Powell Free, the Berkman Center, and, and, and all the participants of the task force. I think this is a valuable contribution to the literature. But uh, you know, it's often said that uh, in a number of situations, life is like, more like a marathon than it is a sprint. And I think that's appropriate here in the online safety context. Um, you know, Just like a, a road race, we've got a number of participants, parents, and teachers, uh, uh, law enforcement companies, and, and even the kids themselves. And uh, you know, it's instructive, I think, that there's not one technological solution, just like there's not one pair of shoes that we can all wear in a road race, but shoes we must wear. And uh, I, you know, I'm not sure where, what milestone we've reached yet. We might be at mile six, we might be on my, mile 13, even mile 20. I'm not quite sure, but wouldn't the panelists agree at least that uh, um, you know, there's, before we get to the finish line, there's still, there's still some work to be done. Um, is, was there a question? I guess what would you like to see to get John. to that finish line, perhaps? But John has an answer. So, <laughs> not sure it was a question, but I would, uh, Mr. Cox, thank you for all that you and that choice do as well. Um, I think one of the key things we need to do before we go have drinks, right, and beyond having drinks, is really to resolve together that there are next steps here that we're going to take, right? So one thing that's really good that's going to happen is that the NTIA, under a charge from the United States Congress, I think as its last act in the Bush administration, is going to charter a new task force at a federal level, which is fabulous that this will continue. We don't necessarily need more talk shops over and over again, but I think we do need a forcing function, a body that says we are going to shine a light on this, continue to ask for the data that we need to continue to um, bring uh, people into the room to work together. I also think there's a real need for the first recommendation that we make in the task force to be carried out. And I think that, um, you know, FOSI and others could be the, uh, the natural venue for this. You know, it's not something that the Berkman Center um, is going to do after today. There are, this is like the last day of school for me. But I do think that it's very important. 
very important that um, we figure out what we learn from this process that will be good for kids. And to me, the key thing, honestly, is this link up between getting the data, identifying what we know and what we don't know, honestly, as researchers, and then also saying what are the technologies out there that are either available to be bought or being brought uh, to bear on kids, and to make an equation out of that, which is safer online spaces for kids and a safer world overall. So I really think the charge back to the members of the task force as I kind of head for the door and grab my drink is I think it's <laughs> crucial that people put their heads together and say, okay, we've all agreed on recommendation one here and otherwise, let's do it. Uh, Blair? I was just going to say I wanted to thank everyone for giving uh, the non-task force members in the audience just a small glimpse of the spirited discussion uh, that I had been talking about. You just saw a little bit of it there. I think I, think I have time for one, one more question. Oh, um, uh, this gentleman and then we'll go to, I can't not call on Donna. Right in the back. And if we could formulate it into a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's a real academic. He knows about questions. <laughs> um, Adon Katz, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, uh, my question actually is um, uh, how the task force would address uh, uh, internet ISP level filtering. Um, I now work uh, particularly internationally in Australia recently. There was a big push um, to, uh, uh, to uh, institute ISP level filtering in particular in regards to child pornography. There's a push by Save the Children Finland and, and, and um, has gained traction at the European Commission. Um, my question, in addition to the general uh, concerns about censorship um, that John Morris raised and, um, and the very powerful comments that I heard throughout about uh, the problem being an offline problem in addition to being something that happens online as well, um, how would you address uh, the calls for ISP level filtering, especially when uh, they seem to be supported by um, groups also interested in ISP level filtering for other reasons, such as uh, catching copyright infringement. So the question is about um, ISP filtering for perhaps sexually explicit material, other type of material, and maybe even copyright. Yeah. John. John Morris, I think you can go. I'm happy to come and brief uh, you. Know, w w one response to is that is that frankly the, the, the focus of the task force was more on kind of individual contact between um, predators and, and, and minors or between you know, you know, minors and minors and cyberbullying context. And so while we did discuss generally some of the issues, we really frankly didn't focus on, on that particular technology as, 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 as something to closely evaluate. Uh, obviously, I think, Aidan, you, you know, you know my, my organization's perspective on that kind of technology um, has been shown in other contexts to lead to to massive, massive unintended consequences and overblocking of of um, lawful content. So I think there are some enormous problems with that. But but the but but the truth is, I'm kind of looking at my task force members and John that that that, that I'm not sure we really really looked at that specifically. I think that's right. So um, Idan. I would refer to page 35 of the task force report. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have, yeah, it's paragraph two, the first full paragraph. But uh, you know, um, it, we say a note on technology is not submitted to the task force. Um, one of the things we identified here was um, we did have a relatively clear mandate, and this fell, you know, slightly outside of it in, in a sense. But we noted that we, we didn't see many technologies um, around the child pornography issue, obviously illegal in the United States. Um, I have a personal view on this outside the. Um, uh, the task force work, which as you know, I've written a book called Access Denied that looks at the country level filtering of this sort and where we find that it's under breath and over breath, there are going to be the problems with this type of solution. So I don't personally happen to be a fan of it, but um, for the purpose of the task force, we noted this as something that we didn't take up in detail, but I'm glad that the EFF and CDT and others are tracking it carefully in Australia and elsewhere. Um, I had the opportunity to, to acknowledge a lot of the uh, child online safety advocate uh, organizations that were on the on the task force, and I think I named I think I named all of them in the room. Also, um, Alan Simpson from Common Sense BD is here and runs a terrific program uh, as well. There's so many great uh, nonprofit organizations working on these issues. Um, I think there's a lot of energy behind um, that issue, and, and it will help guide them. Your report will help guide them in their work. Um, and for the last question, I'd like to let it, Donna Rice Hughes have the last question. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, it, you know, it's really been a, a pleasure working with everybody, and, um, and I think it's been important that this report was put together. 
Um, and we certainly agreed more than we disagreed. Um, but I'm going to try to turn this into a question. <laughs> so I'm going to direct it, I suppose, to you, John. Um, you made a point about, um, I, I think it was the NGOF study, where you know the, the predators are not disguising themselves, and that the kids are going willingly you know, to meet these predators. And one of the things that we mentioned in our one pager um, is that, and, and I also asked the researchers when they presented this information, I asked them if the grooming process was factored into this. And they say clearly it was not. And so I just, you know, would like to caution all of us that when we make those kinds of statements that we put that into perspective. Because we don't know at what point along the grooming process um, the, the predator does dis disclose their age because we know when they're going to get them offline, they can't have said that they were 21 and turn out to be 35, of course. So it's somewhere along the process that is disclosed. So, um, and, but, okay, so here's my question, though. I found interesting in the one-pagers that many of us said that while age verification does not work uh, well on social networking sites for a variety of reasons, it does work with respect to protecting kids from sexually um, uh, oriented types of material like pornography. So here's my question, okay? I'm coming all the way around and I could end up with my head on the platter instead of Blair here, but if COPA comes back up, all right, if, if that gets challenged again, would my fellow uh, task force members support age verification in the context of COPA? In the context of keeping children away from pornography? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think the report acknowledges that, that, um, that age verification is already, has already proven to be useful in terms of alcohol sales and you know, cigarette sales and also um, adult content. So um, it's already employed in that way. Sure, I, w I would agree with, with the important caveat of if it's a government mandate, we then face all the same problems of people fleeing our shores. We go to Russian pornographic sites. Um, Bartlett, actually, let me, just, can John hand you the microphone? Right. You're, you're lavalier as well. So in a government mandate world, where American <clears throat> hosted, however it gets defined, sites are required to put in age verification software, people flee to Russia, et cetera, to look at Russian pornography, then you've solved absolutely no pr nothing and perhaps have made the problem worse. So I think it's a, a little more delicate question than asked. That said, I agree with everything Ann said, it absolutely solves the problem to the extent that when you create an adult area site, you have a, a, a database, driver's licenses often, credit cards to check against, which is a huge, I'll mention briefly, a huge problem with age verification that came up over and over and over were the true economic costs, which virtually every peddler of age verification software declined to adequately answer when they were demonstrating their wares. They would often not want to talk about price, but would never discuss economic costs. That is to say, do we need, an aid, do we need some kind of national ID card? Well, if you're going to base your system off a national ID card, then what's the cost? social cost and economic cost to implement, to implement that system in the U.S. So I think it's a much more complicated question. That said, at the 10,000 foot, I absolutely agree with everything Ann said. And I should have provided some background that Donna was referring to the uh, COPA, the Children's Online Protection Act, which re required, it was mandated by Congress um, to, for websites to restrict sexually explicit material, uh, you know, harmful to minors uh, material yeah. um, for children, not to be confused with COPPA, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which is entirely different. I was just I, I think we had our, our pricing in our technology submission. I think you just mentioned all peddlers of ABS. I'm not worried. I wasn't worried about pricing. This, this was my exact point at the meetings. It wasn't pricing. It's economic costs. What's it cost to really implement the system? Which is a different question from pricing. Okay. Yeah, we did not address that. So 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 so, so let me come back and respond. You know, at least on on my individual behalf to say that that you know I, I think under the. The, the applicable First Amendment analysis that the Supreme Court has articulated that, that user-based um, tools, such as filtering tools, um, are, are an, an appropriate and effective way to protect kids. And, and the real pro a, a critical problem with laws like COPA, um, it, certainly, certainly as, as 
has been being litigated for the past 10 years, or now I suppose 11 years um, in the federal courts, is that laws like COPA would prohibit 16-year-olds um, from getting access to safe sex information. And, and I think that you know, the, the, you know, the, the idea that um, you know, we should have a, an age verification process that prevents older minors from accessing content that perhaps even their parents don't want them to access, but they have a constitutional right to access. Yes, I would be very concerned about a government mandate to do that. Now, voluntary use of, of um, technology, if, 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 if a site wants to create a a, a, a kid-friendly or an adults-only environment and wants to use technology that you know, Aristotle offers to, to, to do that voluntarily, I think that's great. The site can do that. So with that, um, I want to thank John Palfrey and the Berkman Center for coming and presenting today. I want to thank the, the selection of panelists from the, tech, the task force. Um, I welcome you all in the, in the, in the name of collegiality uh, and cooperation to join us for a drink in, in the lobby. Thank you very much.